Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I just uh, got a notification that our third speaker, uh, Megan McDonald, the COVID bug has hit us again. So uh, she's hoping for a stomach virus. Her husband has COVID, so in these days, that all makes sense. Um, I hope she has a stomach virus too. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, so we are uh, going to go with our two great speakers here. Um, first, I wanted to thank you all for joining us here and for those that are joining us virtually. And a special thanks to our speakers. What we're gonna do is uh, each speaker is going to uh, speak for a period of time if their uh, time is not um, completely used, we'll be taking questions. Um, and if not, we'll take questions at the end. So we really do want to get as many uh, questions answered and leave you with some good takeaways. See, Mary Margaret, I need this speaker for, um, for church. I think this one works better. <laughs> uh, Mary Margaret always tells me that I don't speak loud enough at church, so this is great. Um, and I'd like to start off by giving a, a, a shout out to all our Centerville businesses. The past two years have really been a struggle. And um, I honestly can say that I've been really inspired by all of you. Uh, in, you had to make some pretty dramatic changes. And in some cases, you made them within a 24 hour period. Um, I, I can't say how grateful I am to all our businesses. And um, you really took courageous moves and a lot of ingenuity. And it's those skills that I think will really keep you, uh, we don't wanna talk you know, that we're recovering. I want you to thrive and it's those skills that you're gonna need to tap into and continue to be courageous. Um, and when you talk about being courageous and resilient, um, I think there's no better segue than to introduce Dale Walls. His personal story and professional story is one of resilience, so take it away, Dale. Take it away. All right, cool. How you guys doing today? So I'm not going to be used to a mic. Normally I can project my voice and don't need this, but this is for the online folks today. So thanks for everyone being here. Um, um, yeah, I mean, for me, number one, Carol, thanks for thinking of me in this capacity, and I've been excited to work with you for this, so thanks for putting this all together, because I think it is an important topic, um, and fits uh, really well with what I'm passionate about today, and what I wanted to talk to everyone about really is um, just, I guess, how things you know, work with regard to, you know, being in a business, whether you're an entrepreneur or a business owner or any kind of organizational leader, um, you know, it comes down to our having a high performance mindset, right? You know, it's a, it's a, it's. I, I remember back 2016, um, and I had been. So my background, I started Corsica Technologies, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But when I started that business, I was about three years into it, and I was probably at one of Linda's networking events, and someone was talking about all the Mini Coopers going around or whatever, and someone said to me, some somewhere's along the road, and says. You know, it must be nice having your own business. And I said, well, obviously, you never had your own business before because there's nothing nice about it. There's some nice things about it, but, you know, it really takes um, a different type of resilience to hashtag, you know, this, this conference. But, um, you know, it really takes a, a, in what I call high-performance leadership. So jumping into this. You know, my background is that. So I'm born and raised from Centerville, um, grew up in the Heights, actually, in town limits. Um, and, you know, I grew up, you know, broken home. My parents split up. I was in second grade. My mom and I found ourselves at my grandmother's house over in the Heights, uh, sharing a bed in the attic, you know. Um, and so uh, grew up just really lost. And it wasn't until, um, you know, my junior year of high school, um, I got a letter in the mail from Boy State. You know, American Legion puts this on, um, and it's a it's like a one week long boot camp. Uh, this one was out in Westminster, Maryland, and uh, it was a letter to, that invited you know incoming senior boys to come out in their summer uh, to this boot camp. And so that letter came in the mail. Um, somewhere a few weeks later, I ended up getting in a fight at Love Point Park, and uh, I came home a, a bloody mess, um, and. 
walk into my grandmother's house. I'm covered in blood. She's losing her mind. And uh, long story short, I end up in uh, Easton Memorial getting stitched up in my lip. And I remember sitting in there and uh, the nurse who are practitioner or whatever it was had just left from sticking that Novocaine needle in my bottom lip, which have you ever had stitches? That's, that's the worst part. And so um, I remember once she left, I kind of see my mom sitting in a corner and she's kind of like, I could see that she was upset, like she was shook, and like here we were. And I think that was like the first time I realized like the things I was doing, being directionless, um, you know, was, was more than me, right? It was affecting the people around me. Um, and she looked at me, you know, and my mind says, tear in her eye and says, will you go to that boy state? And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So I go to boy state, and um, so it's put on by American Legion, but it's run by the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, so there's local Marines that are there, and they're, they're drilling us like boot camp for that week or whatever. And I, I sat one night, we do shifts, and um, I sat one night with a corporal who was just kind of challenging me, like, what are you doing with yourself? You know, where, what are you going to, are you going to college? Are you, uh, you know, what, what's your job going to be? Whatever. And, um, and he really kind of introduced me to what the Marine Corps was. I didn't know <laughs> there was a Marine Corps, honestly. I thought everything was Army and whatever I saw in the G.I. Joe cartoons. So I didn't have any kind of background in military or anything like that, but he, he intrigued me and gave me kind of this direction. And I came back, I, I met with a recruiter, I depped in, uh, delayed enlistment program, which means I joined the Marine Corps before I started my senior uh, year. And then that next summer, I went away. And what that did for me was um, really give me some direction, you know, kind of put me on a path. Because that year was my best year in school. All my previous, previous years were crap. I, w I was like, man, my, knowing my family went to college, I'm not going to college. Why do I care about my grades? And that, that reflected. But, um, you know, the minute I was given some direction, you know, something to charge towards, um, that was it. You know, so I cleaned up my act and, um, and got focused on what it took to be a Marine. So um, came back, my, my trade in the Marine Corps was IT services, so um, side of the mountain, middle of the desert, uh, especially at that time, I joined in 98 and I stayed in until 2002. Um, you know, I got to be an IT guy when IT guy had to know everything, right? Today, IT is very, you're a web guy or you're a cable guy or a server guy or whatever. Back then, I had to know all that and I got trained in all that. Um, and was fortunate enough to get a, a marketable skill, which was my plan in the first place, um, but came back and started what ultimately became Corsica Technologies. I ran that company from 2003 till 2018. I sold the business. I stayed on for another 18 months as CEO, quadrupled the business in that 18 months, and said sayonara and, um, and, and switch gears for me. And kind of secretly, I tell people online, I'm seeing all my friends from the Marine Corps, like they're, 38, they had been in for 20 years, and they're going, I'm retiring, I'm retiring. So there's this little itch I had to be able to say, I'm retired too, um, which kind of, you know, worked on uh, getting me out of Corsica. So I still got to check that box still, but uh, on a different path. So uh, that business, just for some business context, I started it with zero employees, uh, adding the yellow pages, zero money. When I walked away from that company in the middle of 2020, uh, we had 200 people. We were employed in, in five different regions around the country. Um, so really, you know, it, it was a true startup all the way through to, to uh, my exit and still running today. So that's my background. Um, so one of the things that um, I get talked to, talk, asked a lot, especially when I got out, everyone's like, Dale, come help me with my business or whatever. And, um, and people would always ask, like, how'd you do it or what, what's, what's the secret and whatever. And first thing... Um, I'll tell you, there is no secret, there is no one way, and I know there's a gazillion books and shows out there about the three steps of this and the seven steps of that or whatever, and all that's fine and dandy to know, um, but there is no one thing, and that's what I ultimately come down to people is like, I've got a core philosophy I can share with you, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to what's working for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, so to dive into that, one of the things that I kind of started with when people would ask me this question is, one of the core tenets of anything in this high performance leadership mindset is establishing clarity. So what does that mean? So to me, 
Establishing clarity is, is a few different things. So first off, you've got to have a vision. What is the vision? Why are you in business? What, what's, the, what's it going to look like? What, not only five years ago, but what's tomorrow going to look like? I talk to a lot of people today that they don't even use a planner. They don't, even, they don't have a game plan for their next day, let alone the next five years. So um, it's really important to have a vision in what you're after, what you're driving towards. Um, what is your North Star? Because that really becomes um, the metric by which you make a lot of decisions, right? Does this or that align with where you're trying to go? Um, not only a vision for your plan for your business, but for yourself. Who do you want to be as that business owner? How do you want to show up for your people? How do you want to show up for your clients? Um, how do you want your business to be looked at by the community? Like, what does that look like? And bring clarity to it. Like, one of the things I like to, to challenge people on is, you know, when you're out on the street or you're not around and someone's going to tell someone else about your business or tell someone else about you, what do you want them to say, right? There you go. That's your, that's your vision. That's your North Star. That's what you start working towards. Uh, the next part about establishing clarity has quite a bit to do with our competence. You know, a lot of times when we get stuck, you know, it's really just because we're not sure what to do, right? And that comes down to our competence and our ability. So sometimes when, when uh, we're not sure or we feel stuck, we've got to start asking some clarifying questions. What don't I know? What, again, what do I, how do I want this to turn out? Things like that to start finding out, is there gaps in our knowledge that we need to fill? A lot of, a lot of stuff today, um, you know, that we'll talk about HR is probably a good example, and marketing as well, which we'll plug a little bit too, but um, there's a lot out there. There's social media, there's should you be TikTok and should you not be TikTok? Like there's all this stuff going on. Uh, what should you be doing with regard to HR in your processes as far as your employees coming in or how they feel about COVID or mass or no mass or whatever? All those things are come down to knowledge and seeking that information out. And the, the one big part about that knowledge as you go through this um, is finding the truth, right? Don't make assumptions. When you're in a leadership role, um, we want to find the truth. We, I'm sure we'll, all local heard the contractors talk about the whole uh, measure twice, cut once, right? And that's really into, like, don't make assumptions. Find the truth of the matter, what's going on, what are, what are the rules and regulations, what are the policies, how are other people having success in marketing. Go seek out the truth. And I think today that's more important than ever because we're all bait and switched with the news headlines and what's online. And all I say to all that nonsense that we get caught up in every week, something new, I just go, what's the truth? Find the truth. Don't get caught up in the headlines. Don't get caught up with what's being said or your own assumptions. Find the truth. So as far as uh, establishing clarity is concerned, uh, establish a vision, know what, not, know what knowledge you need to obtain or what resources can help you with that and seek the truth. Second thing, one of the original uh, Lions Guide, the brand, which I am today, um, started as a Instagram thing where I was just gonna post like inspiration stuff years ago. I was doing it anyway, to, but I didn't wanna spam all my friends online with it, so I was like, I'll make another page. Um, but one of the first things I put on there was around the fact that uh, when it comes to success, I could tell anyone um, the times that I acted courageously, I had success. The times where I let my fears prevent me from doing what I needed to do or what I should have did, that's when the failures came. So the second core value of uh, the conversation today is around having courage. And a couple of things I like to talk about with courage is courage is a virtue, okay? Um, it's about doing the right thing. Um, you know, a lot of organizations always hang, you know, integrity on their core values, right? Integrity defined as doing the right thing even when no one's looking. Um, I challenge that today and say we should also have courage up there because equally as important is doing the right thing even when everyone's looking, right? Um, even when you might be faced with judgment or whatever, but courage is a virtue. It comes down to doing the right thing. Um, the other thing is knowing fear. Um, and this kind of comes back to clarity a little bit. When we're scared to make a move, it often comes back to a lack of clarity sometimes. We're not sure what to do, so we're afraid to make a move. Um, there's also three types of fears I like to talk about. And as humans, 
Um, we fear certainly the physical things, physical threat, loud noises, falling, all those things. Um, but psychologically, we fear other things, such as we fear the pain of loss. We fear the pain of the process. We fear the pain of the outcome. What does that mean? We f we're afraid that if we do something, we might lose something. We're afraid that we're afraid to go through it. You know, a lot of people are always working on health and diet and exercise and all that stuff, but what prevents them is they don't want to go through it. They don't want to go to the gym every day. They don't want to have to eat clean. They, they, they're afraid of the process. Um, and then there's the outcome. Sometimes we're afraid to move because we're afraid that um, if we go through it, it might not turn out the way we want it to, right? So a big part about having courage is shining the light on what are we afraid of? Like, what, what is holding us back? And it goes back to clarity a bit, is to what's the truth of the matter? Like, what am I afraid of? And, and when you think through to courage as a virtue, um, I always take these little fear points that we feel, fear, feel um, like when we feel that anxiety, you know, the qualifier for me is always, you know, is this the right thing to do? Right when we're when we're holding ourselves back, um, or we're trying to make a decision, or whatever the case may be, or we just have one of those pains. We're we're afraid of the loss pain. We're afraid of the outcome pain. We're afraid of the process pain. I always the litmus test for me is is this the right thing to do in the interest of the vision, um, and that almost always answers it. Um, so I treat I call. Uh, fear a call to action. I use this, I coach youth football, I've been coaching for the last um, seven years here locally, so I always get the young guys, first year players, game day comes, they're always real nervous, and this is what I tell them, like, hey, I know that, that little thing you feel in there, like, that, use that as a call to action, that's telling you to do something, right? Um, and that's what, that's what courage is all about. The third thing is leading the way. So, um, I was fortunate enough in my Marine Corps experience that um, I was taught leadership at 18 years old. It was a, we got classes on it. So um, there's a lot there. And early at boot camp, I was just a private, and we're doing a week-long training about leadership, the leadership traits and principles of the Marine Corps, uh, primary and secondary leadership objectives and things like that. And you kind of like have this question in your head as a recruit going, well, I'm not going to be in charge of anyone. Why, why do I need to get taught leadership? I'm just, a, even when I get done with boot camp, I'm just going to be a private. Um, but the answer was simple, is that whether you're in charge of anyone else or not, you're still in charge of yourself. And those leadership traits and principles still apply in how we conduct ourselves. It's not, leadership isn't just how we treat other people, but it's how we lead to those objectives that we set forth in our vision and so on. Um, so we've got to have that leadership mindset. You know, I read a lot, um, between 40 and 60 books a year on leadership, personal and professional development, and they're all going to come back down to this same thing. Even Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he doesn't talk about the seven habits until he talks about responsibility. And that's, in essence, leadership and, and self-leadership because as he, he can teach you all the habits in the world, <laughs> but if you're not going to take personal responsibility personal leadership, self-leadership, to attain the, your objectives, it's all for naught. Um, another thing that I like to talk to people about with regard to leadership is um, we always talk about uh, work-life balance. And a good friend of mine made a good point, which I really love, and I told him I was going to use it all the time now, which was it's not about work-life balance. It's about work-life harmony, right? And the way to kind of put that in perspective a little bit is that um, – we all know how business works. We've got different departments. We've got our finance, we've got our sales, we've got our marketing, we've got our HR. We've got all these departments. And you know that if any one of those elements of your business is failing, the whole ship's going down, right? If your customer service is a problem and your sales are great, it doesn't matter how great your sales are, service is still a problem, or vice versa. You have the greatest service in the world, but if you can't get business. So, you know, as a, as a CEO of a business, let's say, you have a responsibility that all your departments are in order. All those elements of your business are in order. Um, and we've got to have a system around that. And I, I, tell, I challenge people, you know, because people would ask me, Dale, like, you're running the business, you're growing the business, but you're still married to your wife, and you've got three kids, and you're coaching football, and you're somehow still running marathons. Like, how are you doing all this? And I say, I don't just look at the business. I look at it all. Like, I'm the CEO of my whole life right? So my business was just a department, right? My family's another department. My health and wellness is another department. All these things matter. So just like in a business, 
when you're in charge, you've got to be responsible for that all those apart departments are in order. That work-life harmony is actually about you being the CEO of your whole life. And that's that mindset and having that system around that. How, what's, your, what's your order of operations? And your business and, your, and the things you're trying to accomplish are just as a part of that as the rest of, of the things that you're responsible for. Which finally comes down to the team. You know, our leadership mindset and living that way, we got to know that our team, you know, either are energy givers or energy takers, right? So we got to analyze, just like we do in our business, what does our team look like? Who's helping us win? Who's not? And we got to level that up and kind of take that outside the office with that work-life harmony as well and go, hey, who's helping me work towards my vision for my business, myself, my family, whatever, and who's taking away from it and start to make the right adjustments to get you where you want to go. So that's it. My three core values and the high performance leader philosophy is establish clarity, have courage, and lead the way. So um, that's that with, and this is a short version of a lot of what I do. So um, since uh, I retired out of Corsica, um, and one of the reasons I started Corsica was I was passionate about what I knew as far as IT and helping the local businesses around here and kind of um, serving them in that capacity. And Lion's Guide, like I said, started when I got out of course, I was just going to make t-shirts that I wanted, you know, it's like, oh, I'll make some cool t-shirts and sell them. Um, and I was working with a marketing um, strategist and after a few sessions together, he's like, Dale, question. I said, yes. He said, well, you've got this story. You started this business. You had the success or whatever. He's like, you think all you got to offer the world is making them t-shirts? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, people could learn from your lessons and, and these things or whatever. So um, I, I took it as a compliment at first. I was like, yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that, you know, whatever. And I slept on it. I realized the next day I got up and just kind of, it was still dragging on me a little bit. And I said, you know, one of the things, especially in those last 18 months of hyper growth at Corsica, what I loved about my day was working with, because I was a leader of leaders at that point. I had guys that were in charge of marketing, in charge of all these different things. Um, but I loved getting out, coming and helping them go win, like, you know, and, and working with them one-on-one -on -one or leading the team or whatever. So I reflected on uh, what that gentleman had told me. I said, you know, hey, man, you're right. We're going to pivot, you know, because I would love to get out of bed every day and go help entrepreneurs, business owners, or other organizational leaders really figure their stuff out and, and really break through to the next level. So that's what Lions Guide's all about. If you want to check us out, we're online. So I got Facebook, Instagram, all those fancy things where you'd expect to find us. Um, but oh, you can always email me as well, but that's what I'm doing today. I'm here to help serve the businesses in any capacity I can. So thank you. And we're going to turn it over to Dr. Reber Basinski. Bus got it. Um, who's going to talk about HR. Thank you. Yeah, you want this? Uh, yeah. How's everybody? Great. Great. Good. Are you related to Cindy? No. Oh. <laughs> no. Would it be her husband or I don't have a clue. Um, my husband's from Baltimore. Okay. So. So you maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. She retired from the law after Thank you. Hawaii. Perfect. Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Reba Bozinski, and I just want to share a little bit about me before I get started. Um, I grew up in Mellington, Maryland, in case everybody knows where that is. And you know, there's like one traffic light and whatever. And I grew up on a horse farm outside of Mellington. So when I was, and I went to Kent County High School, and so then when I was going to school, my parents, I was the hours out of yours, mine, and ours. Do you know what I mean? Like my mom and dad both had been married before, so they had kids from previous marriage and I was the only ours. And my parents were much older when I was born than a lot of parents are. So when I was going to high school and everything, my parents were like, you just need to get a job. We have no, no money for you to go to school. And nobody talked to me about financial aid or anything like that. So I'm like, okay, fine. So I went and got a job. And then I got married, was married for 18 years, and have two beautiful children who are um, 38 and 29. So they're doing great. But in my 30s, I guess I guess it was around 32, 33, um, 
Well, actually, when I was 29, I went to work for MBNA. Do you guys remember? Have you remember MBNA? So I went to work for them. Well, then after I was in there for a while, they, you know, a lot of the people there were young. And they were college graduates and this and that. And I was like, man, that's, that would be really cool to do. So I actually started my bachelor's degree when I was 35. So, and then when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, my daughter was going to be graduating the very next year to, with her high school diploma. So I'm like, man, I got to get this done because I do not want her to steal my thunder and I don't want to steal hers. The, you know, like having to share that whole graduation period. So I busted butt and finished it. And then she graduated and then she went to U University of Delaware. And then she, afterwards, she's like, come on, mom, go back and get your um, master's with me. So I always liked helping people. Like when I worked for MBNA, I started out in collections. And then I ended up moving to HR, or like the payroll department, because I always wanted to help the internal people, you know, as opposed to the external people. So, and then I went ahead and um, MBNA paid for my bachelor's degree. And then we went on to Wilmington University for both of us graduated in two years with our double masters. And then I was like, well, I really don't want to start paying for these school loans yet. So let me just go ahead and sign up for my doctorate. So I got my doctorate in um, organizational and in industrial and organizational psychology, which again is the internal people. The industrial part is like helping the employees and the organizational part is the senior management. So I always was like, oh, you know, I really want senior management to take better care of their people. Because without them, you have nothing. So then I was in an HR manager for UPS for a while and all that. But I want to just give you a little background like on why it was so important for me to help people on the inside. And just like Dale, it's like without the leaders recognizing who their people are, you're not going to have anything. And like hiring new people now, like you know, you see help wanted everywhere, right? Well, I've had so many people tell me that they apply and apply and apply, and it just must fall in some black hole somewhere because they're not getting any kind of response. Or they get the first you know, interview, and then nothing happens after that. So it's, it's very discouraging for people. So once they do get hired, it's, you know yourself, you're second guessing yourself all the way to that trip from when you leave home and you're not going this way, you're going this way this time for a new job, right? You're second guessing yourself like, oh my God, is this gonna work? Is this gonna be good? And then you get there and then you were put behind a desk somewhere here, sit here for th and, you know, a week watching these videos, which is very common, isn't it? And it's very disheartening because you feel like this is not what I signed up for. for. So I, as an HR person, I really want to make sure that the onboarding process is enhanced so the people feel like right from the start that they made the right decision. Because um, that sets the tone for everything. You know, because then they're going to obviously get around some naysayer in the, in the workplace somewhere, and then they're thinking, yeah, yeah, this is not what I signed up for. So, I want to um, kind of get that turned around for people. Let's see. OK, so can we play this video? You think so? It's embedded in it. So do I just press something? This is just about something that I think that you'll find entertaining. I think so. Um, that's okay. If it doesn't work, then we can figure it out. Or I can tell you what it's about. It's not working? I know, yeah. and at home it was, but that's okay. I'll tell you what it was about. So anyway, 212 degrees.
Have you, has anybody ever heard of that or talked about that be, with you before? Okay, 211 degrees, water's just there. 212 degrees, it's steam and it's boiling. And with steam, you can do so much with it, right? You can run a locomotive, you can fire up a furnace and all this stuff, right? With just one degree. So that's the whole point of it. Just persevere one more degree. Like, and in the video, it talks about how the people in the Olympics and the, you know, the marathon people, that all they need, is, and they win by 0.0024 seconds. You know what I mean? Because it's just like one more little bit. So if you can help encourage your people just to do one more little bit, that's going to be, but you know how they do that? They see you doing it. When they see that you're doing the extra effort, even if you don't want to, you know, if it's going to benefit them or benefit the company, because guess what? If you're not benefiting the company, who's, what's going to happen to the company? It's going to go away, right? And then you're going to be getting unemployment if that, and then that's going to be like hardly anything compared to what your regular salary is. So it's a huge thing just to encourage that with the people. Does anybody have any questions about that? But it doesn't make sense, right? And it, the video is really cool. So if you ever want to watch it, it's called um, simpletruths.com is the website and simpletruths.com. It has lots of free videos and things like that on there that are um, um, very motivational and inspirational. Let's see, is it working? Here we go. Okay, so the one thing that I wanna talk about a lot today is emotional intelligence. Have you, have, who's heard of that? Okay, so um, I just wanna briefly go through this because normally I can take a day or two days, I mean a half a day or a day to go through this, but I just want to go through it kind of quickly with you. So the biggest thing about emotional intelligence, and I actually have an assessment if you, um, you can just email me and I can send the assessment to you. It's the short one, it's like 25 or 30 questions. Um, but the biggest thing is it helps with that assessment, it helps whether, identify whether you are more worried about yourself or worried about the other people. And there needs to be a balance. Because if you're worried about the other people all the time, then who are you neglecting? Yourself, right? And then if you're worried about yourself all the time, then who's being neglected? Your people are being neglected, right? So it kind of comes back down to that um, thing where you're in an airplane and something's not just right, and they tell you to put your oxygen mask on. If you put it on your child first and you lose your oxygen, how's, who's gonna help that child, right? So if you put your oxygen mask on first and take care of yourself through personal development, you know, being more aware of your own emotions, what triggers you, then you'll be able to help your people more because you'll recognize things more in them. So one of the first things is self-awareness. So it's the ability to recognize and understand your own emotions and being aware of what affects your actions, moods, and emotions on other people. So I'm pretty sure that probably all of us have walked into work and their manager's sitting there and they're like, mm -hmm. you know, you can just tell, you can just feel it, right? The energy is just not good. Obviously that manager is um, having a stressful day. Now if it's, if it's an abnormal thing for that, then you're all about it. Like, oh my gosh, are you okay? You know, you don't feel okay. Um, then that's, you know, you're concerned. But if, you, if that's the normal thing, that's kind of sets a whole nother tone to the situation. Um, the next thing is social skills. Being able to interact well with others. Um, allowing people to build meaningful relationships with other people and develop a stronger understanding of themselves. So you know what triggers you. Because guess what, when you have a team of people, the chemistry is not gonna be there between you and every single person on your team. There's gonna be some people that are gonna challenge you more than others. 
Do you know that rule? 20% of the people take up 80% of your time. So it's, you know, you just have to recognize that and be mindful of that for yourself. Like, and know that this person, because I've had managers come in and make me the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Like, oh my God, why didn't they take off today? You know, it was so much nicer when they weren't there. And then as a leader, you, you want the people to be there with you, right? So, and that comes down to motivation. Motivation by things beyond external rewards, like fame, money, recognition, and acclaim. Passion to fulfill their own inner needs and goals, internal rewards, always looking for ways to do it better. That's what you want to instill in other people. Is the mo Actually, I, and you can probably um, attest to this or compliment this, that motivation is not something that you can do for other people. It's kind of something you have to, the motivation has to come within you. You can be inspired by other people, but the motivation comes from within, whether you want to do it or not. And would you agree? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's kind of known that there's um, a motive, right? The source of the word motivation, their motive is, the motive is individual. What drives that person? What are they driving towards? And then, you know, motivation is kind of like, and ultimately like their why, so yeah. to speak. Exactly, that's perfect. That makes sense, right? So, um, yeah, just being able to be aware of your own emotions and how you're interacting with other people and how are your internal feelings motivating you to do that. That's one of the things that just, it really helps to be more, more, much more aware of that. And then, this is the golden rule. Treat others how you want to be treated. So if you want to be treated good, then you treat other people good, even if they're not so good. Kill them with kindness. Don't you remember hear, hearing people talk about that? OK, so then the next part is the social skills. And this is the external part. Like This is the um, part where you're recognizing things in other people. So being able to interact well with others allows people to build meaningful relationships with other people and develop a stronger relationship with them, of themselves. You know, just being able to recognize when you have a team member or when you have somebody that's just showing up for the first day, you be aware that they're gonna have these certain feelings and you wanna, and you wanna ease their fears because that's gonna be the, one of the biggest things when they come in as a new person is, or now, people coming back into the office. You're having all these people come back in. They had all these relationships before, right? Well, they may not have spoken to these people for two years. Is that like a brand new business? Going into a brand new company, you gotta build up these things again, right? You gotta build up these relationships again. So just be mindful of that and just be aware of how they're feeling and what and just be knowledgeable of that. And empathy is ability to understand how others are feeling and accurately interpret the different situations. So maybe you have somebody that's been there for years and now they have all these new people coming in. Does that mean that you only concentrate on the new people and you let the person that's been there for a while just sit over there on the side because you know they're all right? That's not a good idea, right? One of the things that I was talking, thinking about with restaurants and services, service kind of companies, what do you think about um, having videos made? Like short little training videos. Like for instance, if you're in a restaurant situation and you have new servers that are coming in, maybe they could just watch these on their own time. Short little, you know, three minute videos where you go in and you have senior people, there's pretend customers, and then you have them do that, you know, like a senior server go in and like do what their job would normally do the best way possible to show them that model of what it really looks like, what the expectations of the company are. Because that's a, that's a um, big thing too, just having the people understand what's needed 
and what the expectations are. If it's like, um, you just assume because on the resume it said they had been a server three years ago, that may not be like what it is now, right? And another thing on the flip side of this, especially with the emotional intelligence part as, as management, the restaurant industry is supposed to be one of the hardest industries for abuse, for um, just verbal abuse, just bad, even worse than that. Because the customers are not so nice sometimes. So if your people don't feel like you have their back, like for instance, let me just give you a scenario real super fast. If, let's just say that you folks were the customers and you guys were the servers and you came over and you're serving them and I'm sorry, sir, I don't know your name, but pretend that you're just like really half lit with been drinking too long and you, and then here comes this nice lady and you just are really not nice to her. So then she comes to Dale as the manager and she's like, this customer is really not treating me very nice. And Dale's like, that's okay, just go ahead, go ahead and you take care of them from now. What does that do for that lady? Exactly. Does it even make her feel like she's valued at all? Not at all, right? She's, she's, you are really not valued. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so I'm trying to, you know, just like, the best thing for him to do would be maybe go ahead and, you know what the best thing to do would be for him to walk over to you and say, sir, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. That would be the best scenario. Pack up your stuff, sir, and you have to leave. And for him to stand there until you leave. Because that way he doesn't have a chance to catch you again. Because it could be worse next time. You know what I mean? That would be the ideal situation, to ask that customer to leave. Because in that way, it sets the tone for the rest of the servers, too. And it could be you as a guy. You could be totally, who knows what this, a customer could say to you. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a woman, you know what I mean, in a bad situation. So that's where the, you as a person, as the management person, or even as a, another server, have that empathy and say, oh my gosh, are you okay? You know, and then, you know, talk to them about it. Talk to them what happened. And then, you know, show empathy and then that makes them feel like that they're valued, they're part of the team, they're part of the family that's, that's working here. So I know in the, in, from working with other restaurants, it's a really big thing. And then, when they, and then when the servers get dismissed like that, or a water person or bread person gets treated not so good, it really sets the tone for the rest of the people. So I just wanted to give you that um, little quick thing. I also have, um, now would be a good time. I have these things from my um, slides that I can hand out to you. Sir, would you mind, would you mind handing them out? Thank you. What did I do with my little clipper thing? Okay. Okay, so the home rule is treat others how they need to be treated. So that's kind of elevating it up a little bit, right? So, and that makes them most happy, right? when you treat them the way they want to be treated. So how do you figure that out? They don't, they don't write a book about it. They don't fill in a book when they come, right? You have to have like empathy. You have to know, like be a paying attention to the folks that are working with you. It can be your peers. It can be your um, team. It could be, you know, your, even your manager. You can do all of that. Because the managers, even though they may have the manager title, that doesn't mean that they're not people. You know, um, they, you could have, like, like Dale, for instance, he's a big deal, right? But when his children cry in the middle of the night, he gets up and has to go to them with his wife, right? Also, he's like, will you please take the trash out again? You know, you know what I mean? Like, he's a person. He just has a family, just like everybody else. So... That's so even though they may have the manager title or a higher title, it doesn't mean that they're not people. 
and that they don't have those same kind of things. So um, I found working at MBNA and working with the um, senior management and UPS and so forth that it's they appreciate that because sometimes they don't get that personal touch. So it really helps. Plus, I was controlling their payroll, so they really wanted to be nice to me. <laughs> okay. So what leaders can do to prepare for the new normal? You want to hire high-quality staff with a growth mindset. They don't necessarily have to have an entrepreneur mindset, but that helps too. Um, but just a growth mindset where they are always thinking of forward. How can we make this better? How can we make this better so we can move ahead, you know, and do something else? Um, embrace the company's culture. But if they don't know what the culture is, how do you get them to figure that out? You just have to work with them, right? And share with them what your goals and visions are. Um, implement performance matrix. One of the things that I just read about was um, instead of giving like a cost of living raise, go back to more of the performance um, where it's based on your performance what your increase is, as opposed to you know, an overall over the board increase. Because sometimes the overall increase, if I'm working really hard and you're not, I'm sorry to pick on you, sir. <laughs> um, if, if you're, you're working really hard and I'm not, how about that? <laughs> and then, um, but I'm going to get the same raise as you. How frustrating is that? Right? But you have to break these things in. It's not like you can just come in all of a sudden one day and make this change. So it kind of has to be worked in and get the buy-in from the folks, too, and figure out how it's going to affect everyone. Um, provide developmental opportunities. That's crucial, because what do people feel like when you say, oh, yeah, OK, you can go to that training. You ask me, and you want to go to this thing like today. I'm like, OK, it's on work time, no problem. Figure it out. Like, figure it out how you can let this person go. And he's going to bring back, hopefully, gold nuggets that he can share with the rest of the company, right? So he, you want to make sure that people are doing it. The, anyways, the more developed they are, are they making your company better or worse? Better, right? So that's all the more important reason to do that. I'm really running out of time, aren't I? I'm sorry. Yeah, we can go. go. Um, retain great talent. You know they have this new thing now, and I don't know if it may be so new, but um, it's having stay interviews. You know how like when um, people leave, you have an exit interview, and then they gripe to you about all the things that why they weren't happy when they left. But what about asking the people why they're staying? Why are you staying? What am I doing right? What can I? continue to do right in order to retain more people. Because you're, when you lose people, what happens with them? What, what do they take? All their knowledge, right? All their experience. Don't you just wish that you could just put a thumb drive in them, only download the information about work? Not all the other stuff, right? But um, yeah, it's just like being able to retain these good people is really helpful. And plus, what does it do for the new people coming in? Oh my gosh, this person's been here five years. This person's been here seven years. What does that say about the company? If, if it's not a brand new company and the people have only been there 14 months, eight months, that's a big difference than 14 years and eight years, right? So it makes a huge difference. Um, be authentic and transparent. That kind of goes without saying. Just be authentic. Just be yourself. If you share with them what they can handle and keep to yourself the rest. Um, and support diversity and inclusion and equity. You know a lot of companies, a lot of people that are um, higher level people are now looking on the websites of companies that they would like to work for. And they're looking on there to see what kind of diversity and inclusion and equity programs they have. What do their staff look like? What do the pictures of the people look like on the website? 
If they don't see anybody that looks like them, mm, that might not be such a good thing, right? They may not, they may be like, oh, and look at the talent you may have missed. So just keep that in mind. Create a flexible and strong culture that is psychologically and physically safe. That's huge. Physically safe, especially in with COVID. What kind of um, guidelines do they have? Are they following CDC or are they just being like, Psh, whatever to CDC? I'll make up my own rules. Well, then half their people are sick and then they get the other half sick and it's just a mess, right? So um, that's the physically safe. That's part of the physically safe. But the psychologically safe is probably bigger. When they come up with new ideas, what do, what, do you just dismiss them? Oh, yeah, 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 we'll get back to you. Or else you, the manager takes them for themselves and gets the credit for it. When they, actually the idea came from somebody. Because when the people walk in the door, they don't walk in with a blank slate. That's what I tell my students all the time. I forgot to tell you that I was a professor as well. But the, my students don't walk in from, with a blank slate. They're coming in with their experiences, their knowledge that they have. I learn as much from my students as they're learning from me. So just know that part. Um, thank you so much for passing those papers out, by the way. Um, another thing is some people are really struggling with money right now, right? Companies are struggling. But there's so many non-monetary ways that you can recognize your people. Um, some of them are employee of the month, voted by the peers. When I worked for UPS, they had this um, program where every month they, people would, like if you help me, ma'am, let's like, just say I was on a project and I came to you and I'm like, can you please help me? And you help me. Then I could write up one of these little cards saying, whatever, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but whatever, um, help me with this project. Thank goodness for her because I was able to get it finished. And then I have to get my manager to sign off on it and then it goes to her manager. If she's not on some kind of discipline thing, then she gets recognized for it. And, I, and me as the person, I'm not gonna know whether she's on some kind of discipline thing. So that is why it has to go to the management. When I was managing a team on, at UPS, I made my folks write something every month. Somebody helped you. Somebody helped you. Just write it up. And then for the people on my team that received these little notes, I put them up on a board. And then the next month I took those down and put the new ones up. And it was just like, it was so simple to do that. And it was just like these little teeny cards, you know? Um, photograph your staff and have a designated area where you can show that you had your staff meeting or you had a luncheon or something. Um, and know your staff one-on-one. -on -one. Don't let every time you went to talk to this person one-on-one -on -one for it to be a disciplinary thing. That's the same way with me with HR. Look, when I walk down the hallway, people won't even look at me. They're looking down, they're looking out the window, they're looking somewhere else, but not at me. Because they're afraid like, oh shoot, what's she gonna find out today? And that was not my point. That's not what I was there for. But some HR people are. Um, employee resources. This is another thing. Mental health. That's so important to know, to have the resources. Even if your company doesn't have it and you can't afford to pay an, um, a third party to do that, at least have the county and the state resources. There are so many resources out there. Just know what they are and have them posted somewhere. Just so they don't have, they can hurry up and write the number down so it's still, you know, nobody has to know. Because who knows what people are going through. Let me tell you, the abuse, the addiction, all of that. You guys know that that has gone up so much in the last couple years. And everybody doesn't want to share their business, you know? So it's, um, if having those resources available makes a big difference. Um, Recognize burnout and support, work-life balance, or now I'm gonna start using work-life harmony. I love that, what you said about the, being a CEO of your whole world, right? 
That's such a, that's so great. I love that. I'm, I'm hoping you're okay with me borrowing that. Um, support volunteer causes. So like if your people are involved in MS or some kind of something that they're involved with that need help, you know, try to at least let the team know so the people that can go know about it. And that way you can help each other. And pair up mentors with mentees. That's a huge thing too for um, new people. They have them partner up with somebody. Um, I have a um, fun employee engagement activities tip sheet. It's got like 60, 60 things on there that you can do. Um, just email me and I can email a copy of it to you. Um, does anybody have any questions?